Hello, welcome to another session on Ready for PET. Today we're discussing equipment and instrumentation. We have the pleasure of having Dr. James Case, who is the Scientific Officer of Cardiovascular Imaging Technologies from Kansas City, Missouri, and an active participant in multiple cardiac PET programs. Dr. Case will discuss equipment and he likes to call it, welcome to Dr. Case's neighborhood. Dr. Case. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, here's my, uh, my disclosure slide here. I'll take a moment to look at those. Okay, so what, uh, rather than go through a number of slides, uh, I'm going to show some of the, uh, the things that we did in setting up our, in our, our pet uh, program here at uh, St. Luke's uh, Health System in Kansas City, Missouri. We started with PET back in 2001 with a single dedicated PET scanner. And even though the instrumentation has evolved, a lot of the concepts of what, uh, what we do to make those decisions are, uh, are the same today. And so I'm gonna give you a tour of, of our facility here and go over some of those, uh, those key concepts. Our institution here is in the heart of an urban center which uh, Kansas City, Missouri, which uh, encompasses several uh, several million people in the metropolitan area and services uh, several different uh, hospitals. So the needs of this institution is the first thing that we do in doing this. Now, if you're talking about a smaller private practice, you may have different needs. You may be looking at a dedicated pet system with a line source, larger institution where we share equipment between the different specialties, we're looking at a PET CT and as, as a, the right solution for us. So when you start down the road of choosing the right equipment, you really need to understand your community that you're working in and the institution that you're working in and how you're gonna partner with all those different groups. Yeah, you mentioned uh, dedicated, uh, which I think is uh, uh, in a sense a good startup. I guess the question is that I understand um, those types of cameras are becoming very difficult to find. Yes, good question. Yes, I mentioned dedicated systems and those are only available in the refurbished market. And what we're seeing today is a transition between those dedicated systems into hybrid imaging. There's so many advantages, both in terms of reimbursement and uh, as well as the quality of care that you can get with that and the ease of use that with the right software in the right training, that's something that we're seeing even across the board from big institutions like the Mid-America Heart Institute, all the way to the smaller clinics. Hearts is becoming even more difficult for the, some of the older camera systems. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good point. Maintaining these, these dedicated systems is becoming progressively more difficult. And I think if you're working on a dedicated system today, you probably are need to be thinking about pathways for replacing that instrumentation. Another important consideration in choosing your equipment is the type of hot lab that you're gonna be using. Now this particular hot lab works as both, uh, both a hot lab for, for assessing uh, the, daily, um, the daily QC from our, our generator, as well as uh, receiving for our PET doses and our spec doses. So we can see around here, we have a number of different uh, different boxes which have been sent in from our radio pharmacies as well as uh, waste disposal and two different types two different types of uh, dose calibrators when we transition to PET most of us are also going to be using using SPECT as well so you'll need a, a second dose calibrator for doing your PET dose, uh, doses as well now as we also start looking towards doing F18 commonly in, uh, in the PET lab with uh, FDG right now. And uh, in 2024, we're probably gonna see the introduction of, the, uh, of a fluorinated perfusion agent. We're gonna be using this type, of, uh, this type of dose calibrator as well. So these rooms, the lab, if you're building today, you need to be thinking beyond just handling rubidium because we're gonna see more and more need for F18 tagged products. For small laboratories, uh... Uh, I think it's a very important decision about um, rubidium, ammonia, and then adding F18. You, you're indicating that labs should really start preparing for F18 as well as 
uh, the simple traces we've been using for a while. Yeah, I think I think that the introduction of a fluorinated perfusion tracer will be a game changer in our field. Um, things are going to have to change. The amount of shielding that we have that we use in the laboratory, the amount of um, shielding in our walls will have to change as well. Yeah. Uh, but this is going to be an important addition. And if you're designing right now a new uh, radio, a new um, pet facility, you have to keep in mind F18 will continue to add important uh have an important role in doing cardiac pet and we need to think about uh, how we're going to do that if you're thinking of, of any of the uh f18 product you'll need to consider having one of these rooms available uh to your patients so a question dr case the um there there may be smaller laboratories that will only occasionally do f18 and what i've heard or what i've seen is that uh, they use the camera room to uh, keep the patient while they're waiting for the 45 minutes or so. So they schedule like an F-18 study at the end of the day. Does that make sense to you? That is an alternative because most of these imaging suites do have uh, the lead in the wall and they're separated from the public and the staff. The only problem with that model is that uh, it does monopolize the camera with uh, non-imaging to put a patient in there and wait for the imaging. If you're at the ground floor and deciding how you want to, how you want to design a laboratory, having a room like this built uh, at the beginning of, of your process is probably the better way to go. So here is our PET CT system that we use at the Mid-America Heart Institute. It's a digital PET CT system with, uh, with 100 devices. So one of the things we have to do in this is we need enough room to be able to, to fit the scanner and safely move the patient in and out. This is an inpatient facility, so a lot of our patients are going to be coming in uh, on a gurney, and uh, or we need wheelchair gurney, and all sorts of um, the ability to access this room in the case of an emergency. A second thing that we need to think about when designing our room is where to place the generator cart. This, this cart, we typically start our line from behind the patient. We need to have room behind it to get in and out of, uh, of the room. Then the last thing that we need, coming around over here, with these sorts of systems, come on in, is most of these PET CT systems require a chiller system to be able to keep the system cool when we're scanning. So when you're designing your laboratory, it's not enough to have room for the scanner. You also need uh, the HVAC necessarily to keep the system cool and operational. This entire room is shielded for CT. And so that's something that if you're migrating from a dedicated system to a PET CT, that you have to be aware of. The walls have to contain sufficient lead to be able to block uh, any radiation associated with the PET or the CT component. If you have that CT, uh, is that also shielding adequate for F-18 agents? Uh, it may or may not be. And uh, some facilities that's fixed in some states, the CT shielding will be sufficient uh, from a regulatory standpoint and sometimes not. With, with lead, lead is not a very efficient stopper of the 511 photon that we see with PET. So even though we have a small uh, shield with uh, that can stop most of the X-rays, the 511 pass straight through it. So really when you're talking about your room, you wanna design it in a way to, to use distance from a radiation source like your cart or the patient. And the time of decay is the thing to protect people because shielding in the walls typically is going to not do a whole lot to protect the staff and the public. From the uh, from the five eleven photons, you have a fancy dancy one twenty eight digital camera system, um, but there's also uh, sixteen slice uh, PET CT system. So, give us some guidance. Great question. Great question. The CTs depend a lot on what your institution wants to do. We do a mix of of CTAs. Uh, whole body uh, pets for oncology. Um, so we need a very high end CT for the sort of work that we do. Uh, if you look at the, at the guidelines, 
you need at least 16 slices to do quantitative calcium. You need at least 64 slices to do CTA. And so with our system, we need to, we need that higher end. But if you're looking at just doing attenuation correction or uh, without doing even quantitative calcium, you can get by with a system that uses six slices, so much smaller CT, less expensive CT, that's air-cooled, so we can even skip the chiller. So again, you defining up front how you want to apply cardiac PET CT in your facility will determine all the rest of the things you're going to need, uh, like a chiller, the size of the room, and so forth. The next thing uh, that you need to consider is the processing software that, um, that you're using for reconstructing and performing all the necessary corrections. Uh, PET uh, has, has several different important corrections which are different. I'll, I'll leave it uh, to, for, for you to research these more. But um, it has things, because we acquire in, a, in uh, both the CT and the, or, or uh, CTAC or um, line source attenuation at a different time, in the emission data, there can be offsets. We need software for correcting it. So in this illustration here, you can see a patient having the, uh, the heart outside of the soft tissue region. And that can introduce significant artifacts. Most uh, modern systems today have a, have a method for correcting for these sorts of artifacts. There are also offline software options that allow you for doing these types of corrections uh, away from the camera. Either way, you need to have some kind of software for, for shifting the images between the transmission and the emission data. The, soft, the software that you're going to use has to be able to acquire and make two key measurements. As you can see in the chart down at the bottom, there is a graph of the something called the arterial input function, and that's the activity as a function of time as it passes over a particular region of space. And what we're trying to do is calculate the supply of activity. The second thing that we look at is the myocardial activity. Now, each software package handles this a little differently and may be more or less sensitive to different variations. But when we look at that, uh, how we marry the, the blood flow software to the camera, it's important to understand what, what kind of data is needed for your software program, how much time it takes to process using that software, and, with, and what are the um, strengths and weaknesses of that software so that you can know when to trust the data and when to, uh, when to overrule it. There seems to be a number of software uh, possibilities out there for people, as well as processing. Any thoughts about which one and uh, which one to choose? I know you can't be gen you can't be product specific, but general ideas. Yeah, that's an excellent question. There are a lot of different software options out there for doing blood flow, all of which are trying to measure the same thing. And the choice of software for how to do that depends a lot on the instrumentation that you're using, and uh, uh, and how much time you have in terms of, of processing and display. They each use different approaches, but they all revolve around the same idea of making a measurement of the activity in the blood, followed by a, uh, a measurement of the activity within the myocardium itself, and then using a model for determining uh, blood flow. The decision as to what hardware and software or radionuclide is going to be used in your facility really begins by making an assessment of what your institutional and programmatic needs are. Once you've clearly defined what those objectives are, the rest of your decisions should be relatively straightforward.